9 o'clock here, and it's time to begin my webinar. I want to welcome you all here. Um, I'm Betsy Hill, President and Chief Operating Officer of the Brainware Company. My co-presenter today is Dave Jordan, who is an account executive with the company and works very extensively with clinicians. Just a few housekeeping items as we get started. Uh, first, we are recording today's webinar, and a link to the archived version will be available uh, probably within 24 hours after we finish. Um, you will get uh, um, automatically get a link to that. Um, also, we will be happy to provide a copy of the slides to those who are attending today. Um, if you are watching this as a recording, you can contact us to request a copy of the slides, and that information will be included at the end of the webinar. Please uh, use the chat window um, to communicate with your thoughts, and particularly your questions as we go along. We will try to answer them either along the way or at the end before we finish up. And again, if you encounter trouble with um, audio, uh, sometimes refreshing your uh, browser, refreshing your screen will take care of that as we go along. Okay, let's get started then. To start off, I would like to go through briefly um, a model of cognitive processing that we have refined over a number of years. Um, some of this may seem pretty basic to many of you, but I think it's helpful to set the stage for where different aspects of cognitive training fit together. Models like this I also find can sometimes be helpful with patients or parents, or uh, we work a lot with educators. Uh, when we talk about processes they can't see happening, that uh, we know are happening in our brains, but obviously we don't see them. This is a conceptual model, uh, not a picture of what is actually happening in the brain. Uh, of course, brain imaging is starting to show us a lot of exciting things that are actually happening in our brains as they happen, um, but this will be more helpful for our purposes today to really show the relationships among different mental processes and how they're addressed by different uh, types of therapy. So here, the mental processes of our brain um, start with input from the outside world. Information, of course, comes in through our senses, much of it visual, and most of it actually gets discarded uh, before we even start to process uh, it or to process it to any great degree because we simply can't attend to all of the potential input that, that we're constantly uh, confronted with. At the next stage, after we receive the information, in the stage called perception, we start to give meaning to the information. So we identify objects, we make connections among things that are related, and we see how they fit together. Uh, most of the activity in our brains up to this point is non-conscious and happens in thousands of a second, or sometimes it doesn't happen. And of course, that's when things are not so good and, and when uh, uh, you and uh, other, others who uh, worry about processes in the brain are uh, extremely helpful. After we perceive information, we can use the directive capacities of our mind. That's that little bubble called direction in that third uh, circle up at the top. Uh, and that we use to start to manage the information in a conscious manner. Uh, a term that is now being applied to this class of cognitive skills is executive function. And then the last step that leads to some kind of output can also be referred to as executive functions, but usually higher order, and they operate at a bit higher level. So we choose, we take an action, we make a decision, we plan, in short, we think. And of course, all of these processes interact with and are integrally dependent on all of our memory process, processes, from short-term memory to working memory to all of the various types of long-term memory. As we start to talk about the connection between vision therapy and broader cognitive skills development, um, I need first to say that I am not an expert in vision therapy. However, I did have a personal experience with vision therapy many years ago as a preteen, long before I had any idea that what I was really attempting to do, um, what I needed to do, was to rewire the connections in my brain. I worked with a vision therapist who also worked with Air Force pilots, and after many weekly visits and homework in between, I had an experience that I described at the time as my miracle. Uh, without my glasses, everything in the world was blurry, but one of the exercises I had to do at home in between my sessions with Electra Healy, who was my, my uh, vision therapist, 
um, I had to read without my glasses. And I hated to read without my glasses because I love to read and it just slowed me down. But I was doing it. And while I was reading uh, one Saturday morning, the print just jumped off the page at me and became instantly clear. Uh, my vision therapist, whose name, as I mentioned, was Electra Healy, passed away in 2000, so I can't thank her now. But I do want to thank you uh, for all the patients who haven't yet figured out what a gift it is that you are giving them. So the goals of vision therapy obviously impact the reception processes of our visual system uh, with things like uh, primary goals being comfort, ease, and efficiency. Um, as well as fundamental visual skills and abilities. Clearly, all of these were uh, really critical for me, as they are for many of your patients. When it comes to what we do with the information we gather visually, the processing and interpretation of it, vision therapy enters the realm of perception. Vision therapy is so individualized and differs, I'm sure, among practitioners as well, so there's not really, I don't think, a hard line distinction of where it fits on this chart or how, exactly how far it extends. So I thought a dotted line might be more representative of reality. But it is also apparent that there are a variety of cognitive processes that deal with visual information that we receive and perceive and that are not necessarily traditionally thought of as being part of the primary goals of vision therapy. And those are on sort of the right-hand side of the dotted line. Just because primary vision issues have been resolved does not necessarily mean that our brains are ready to hold on to and manipulate visual information or to combine visual and auditory information or to process subsequent steps with that information at an adequate pace. And those are all the kinds of skills that we refer to as cognitive skills. Here's another uh, chart graphic that we um, often use, uh, particularly with educators, when we talk about cognitive skills. And I've added some basic visual skills uh, down at the very bottom, since some of what vision therapy deals with is arguably at that really, really fundamental level. And what this chart shows is that how these cognitive skills that we've been discussing um, really are essential and sit underneath reading and math. So Many educators uh, and probably many parents and many of the people come to you as, as patients and clients probably think of reading and math as pretty basic, but of course we know that there's a whole lot underneath that. Um, just one other brief anecdote. I have a business colleague who actually had dinner with last night who several weeks ago had been telling me, actually it was a few months ago, had been telling me about her, her daughter and her struggles with reading. And my friend, the mother, was trying to decide whether to start with a vision therapist or with a reading specialist. And she said, I think we need to start with reading. If she can't read, I don't know how she's going to do anything else. Well, she had also told me that her daughter talked about how the words jumped around on the page for her as she tried to read. Um, and I uh, recommended to her that it was very unlikely that a reading specialist was going to help um, and she confirmed with me last night that they did, in fact, work with an outstanding vision um, specialist and that her daughter's life has changed dramatically now. And that now she's, of course, going to work more on her on the specifics of reading. But anyway, down at the bottom of the chart, we have what we refer to as foundational cognitive skills. And these are things like um, attention skills, visual processing, visual spatial processing, processing speed, auditory processing, simultaneous and sequential processing. Um, they're both the basic ways that we get information into our brains from the outside world. And as we talked before, they happen at a non-conscious level. So the most part, for the most part, we aren't aware of them. And of course, your clients aren't aware of uh, them taking place. So if they're functioning effectively and accurately, that's great. But if they're not, of course, then we have problems. Um, and those can impact the hierarchy all the way up to reading and math. On top of the foundational cognitive skills are that group of directive capacities of our mind that I referred to before that are now being called executive functions. And these are singled out because they are so highly correlated with academic success. And in fact, with life success, they are predictive of how much money you're going to make, whether you're not going to end up in jail, what your long-term health outcomes 
are all kinds of things. And the core executive functions are working memory, which refers to our ability to hold information in our mind while we manipulate it. Inhibitory control, which is pretty much what it sounds like, um, but also operates over a more extended period of time if you think about our ability to defer gratification for some future goal. Um, and cognitive flexibility, which when we change our mind based on um, new information about how the world around us is operating. On top of that are higher order executive functions, which include things like reasoning and problem solving and planning. And of course, we want all of our students and ourselves to function at this level. Um, and that's where a lot of education today is focused, especially in terms of the common core standards and things like that. But what this model says, uh, which is really important, is that all of these cognitive skills, all the way up through those higher order executive functions, are necessary for and support the ability to learn to read and to do math and everything else that rests on top of that. But of course, teachers are generally asked to teach reading and teach math and teach everything else without really knowing whether these underlying skills are in place or to what degree, and even if they suspect that it's not altogether there or operating as efficiently as it needs to. There hasn't been a lot that they could do about it. Um, and that's where vision therapy and brain mer safari come into play. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about these connections. Um, uh, these, this may be um, obvious to you already, but I can tell you that um, this is um, really eye-opening for many parents and educators that we talk to. So if you talk to most teachers and ask them what the basics of reading are, you will probably hear something like decoding and fluency and comprehension. And indeed, those are critical reading skills. We cannot be good readers without them. But as you all know, and as we know, there is no decoding part of our brain. In order to decode, we have to have a bunch of different mental processes all operating together at the same time. So if I can't sustain my attention, or my visual discrimination isn't good, or my eyes are jumping around on that page, as we, the young lady we were just talking about, um, or so the words and the letters don't uh, come into my brain, they get jumbled up in a different order, sequential processing. Obviously, that's going to impact decoding. When it comes to fluency, things like visual span, flexible attention, processing speed are all going to help or impair my ability to read fluently. And then comprehension, um, as I say when I talk to teachers, particularly is, of course, where rubber really meets the road. It's why we're learning to read at all. And um, it's here it's really very closely tied to uh, particularly skills like working memory. So if you think about what's happening when you're reading a text, you're getting pieces of information, you're holding in them in your mind as you add additional pieces. Your ability to do that is, happens in working memory. And if you can't do that, then you're losing pieces of information and it doesn't make any sense and you can't connect the pieces. Uh, if you come across a concept or a word that you don't understand, your ability to stop, think about that and interpret it either from context or to ask somebody or look it up and then bring it back into what you were reading without having to start all over again, again happens in working memory. And then of course, Reading and comprehension are all about relating new information to things that you already know and connecting that. When we do that consciously, of course, that also happens in working memory. So without those kinds of things, we're going to be hard pressed to um, really translate um, all of our more basic skills and get them working at the level where we're comprehending what's, what we're reading. The same principles apply in math. Um, one way of considering sort of some of the basics are thinking about spatial representations, which is, of course, where our visual system is so critical. There are things like spatial memory, visualization, directionality are very important. And of course, we use that every time we interpret and extract information from a chart or a graph, or uh, particularly when we deal with geometry or um, those kinds of things. Um, the middle one, information manipulation, I used to describe this as story problems. Uh, back in my day, we did, drew a distinction between arithmetic and story problems. But today, in math and in school, everything is a story problem because everything is supposed to be about a application to the real world. And so um, 
being able to keep track of where we are, the pieces of that story problem, which train is starting where, or who's older than whom, and all that kind of thing, um, of course, requires a good deal of working memory, sequential processing, and focusing on the most important aspects of it. And then ultimately, math is very logical. So using our reasoning and our problem solving and our planning and our inferential skills is going to be important. And of course, there's a lot of overlap, of course, between these two things. We don't have a separate reading brain and a separate math brain. Uh, we have to get all these skills working together. So I want to tell you a little bit now about Brainware Safari. This is the software program that addresses, um, along with the sort of the basics of vision therapy, many of these that pyramid of skills of cognitive capacity and infrastructure that we've been talking about. So it's a software program that develops 41 cognitive skills. Um, it does it quite comprehensively. It doesn't just focus on one particular area of skills. Uh, it deals with visual and auditory and um, memory and attention and sensory integration in a pretty comprehensive way and in a very integrated way. So many programs that you may have heard of or may be aware of uh, tend to focus, again, on a particular area in isolation. But of course, that's not how our brains work. As we talked about uh, just a minute ago with reading or with math, but there are a whole bunch of different processes that have to work together. And that's one of the things that distinguishes brainware. Um, it comes from work that has been done for many, many years in a clinical setting. It actually started off with a vision developmental specialist and a speech pathologist. And those clinicians started to share their practices. Now, over the course of about 40 years, uh, that group of clinicians grew to over 300. And as the group grew and as they um, tried different things, shared best practices, they developed, refined, and codified a group of exercises that were very, very effective in that, um, uh, in that um, environment. And um, Dr. Nielsen, I'll get to that question in just a second uh, because it can be used in a number of different ways. Um, so what happened was that at, at some point, because um, uh, it was evident that not everybody could benefit from or need it, um, although some people clearly do need that um, in clinic support, in office support, um, what we did is take that that group of exercises and marry it with video game technology so that it can be delivered on the computer. Um, the recommended usage, and we're going to talk about the kinds of results that are um, uh, the consequence and come out of using it this way, is three to five times a week for about 12 weeks in 30 to 45, 30 minute to an hour sessions. Um, Recommended for ages, the lowest age would be six, but it can be used all the way up through adults. Um, it can be used in a variety of ways. Um, it can be used um, at home, and we'll talk about how that can benefit in a combination of at home and um, office visits. Uh, it can be used, um, it is sometimes used in a um, therapeutic setting uh, where, uh, or, or some kind of combination of those. It's also used in schools, and we also have done some work um, just um, which you may find interesting in a workplace setting, but we're not really going to focus so much on that today. So just to give you a little um, uh, background on the kind of um, impact that Brainware Safari has had in research, um, I'm going to start with our original peer-reviewed published research because it was published in the Journal of Optometry and Vision Development. Um, it was with students um, in first through seventh grade. They were divided in, <clears throat> excuse me, into a treatment group and a non-treatment group. Uh, the Woodcock-Johnson cognitive battery and some of the achievement tests were used as a pretest and a post-test. In this case, they did use Brainware Safari at home. Um, the parents basically were coaches. Um, and the, the only distinctive feature about why these students were chosen is because um, the parents were a very responsible group and uh, we were Everybody was confident that they would use the program as recommended. Um, just to give you a sense of some of the tests that were administered, um, a variety of different areas of cognitive testing, uh, spanning visual and auditory and sort of higher order uh, uh, processing as well. And then academic tests focusing on reading and math. 
So first I want you want to look at the, what we're seeing here is the pre-test and post-test results for individual students who, who were in this uh, study. Um, what we're seeing is the age equivalence or the intellectual age, if you will, of the students on the pre-test and the post-test. And as you can see, some of them improved just a little bit. Some of them went down a little bit. Not much change for anybody, and on average, an improvement of four months over the three months that elapsed between the two uh, tests. And of course, this is pretty much what we would expect. These were students just going about their normal activities, uh, not having any therapy or intervention, and so they improved about the same amount of time that had elapsed. So probably simply um, a matter of maturation. The, the uh, group that used Brainware uh, had quite a different experience, however, and here you can see the individual results as well as the average results being a four-year, three-month improvement uh, over that three months of time that's elapsed. So it's a very substantial kind of impact that this can have. Um, this, these kinds of results have been replicated by others, different people giving um, the test, different people administering Brainware, a variety of populations in different parts of the country from different socioeconomic status, different races, all kinds of things. Now, the other thing that we did is after the, uh, the first 12-week session, um, we took the what had been the non-treatment group and they became their own treatment group. Um, they were then enabled to use the program over the summer uh, following that initial uh, phase of the study. And here are their results. Uh, in terms of the cognitive improvement, very consistent with what we saw in the original phase one treatment group, here four years and two months growth um, over the summer as they used the program. I need to press that button. Um, to look at, it, at the academic test, here you can see the um, academic results for the non-treatment group, the control group. Um, very little change uh, in any individuals and across the board an average improvement of just one month um, over the three months. So really not an impact academically. And of course what we want is we want to see the impact of cognitive training on academic tests. And in fact we do. So these are the results for the treatment group on the academic, the reading fluency, math fluency, uh, passage comprehension, all those other academic tests. Almost two years worth of growth in those 12 weeks, and of course, as compared to that one month for the control group. Now, we also did that, of course, for the um, what had originally be the, been the control group. Uh, they were doing this over the summer. And so the growth academically wasn't quite as great, it was, but it was over a year, a year and one month, and um, probably because they weren't also in school doing academics all the time. Uh, so that may account for, for that difference. But nonetheless, quite a considerable growth, uh, particularly because they were not in school at the time. Um, Various kinds of results by different cognitive tests. This is all uh, captured in the published version of the study, which we'll send out to you following this. We'll send that along with the slides. But I thought it would be interesting for you just to briefly see um, the, the fact that, of course, um, has different impact. And, of course, you're going to see much different impact on individuals depending on their cognitive strengths and weaknesses. Um, in terms of the academics, again, um, just to make the point that across all of those different areas, uh, not just on an average, but across every single area that we measured in terms of academics, a very significant uh, improvement over the results of the control group. We've now done uh, some 30 some studies. Um, as I mentioned before, um, a combination of academic peer reviewed uh, research and a number of field studies, particularly in schools with the teachers administering the program, uh, with teachers administering the assessments and things like that, and looking at a wide variety of populations from low SES to English language learners. Um, I do want to single out the work that we has been done uh, because it was a very 
substantial peer-reviewed published study with students with specific learning disabilities. And in that study, using the program, using BrainWare Safari for 12 weeks, um, yielded um, cognitive improvement that uh, brought those students virtually to the point, very close to the point of being comparable to normally developing students. Remediation, particularly in those areas of greatest deficit for those students, including working memory, short-term attention, uh, broad, att short, broad attention, short-term memory, um, and executive function. So um, that gives you a little bit of background on the program. What we want to do now is to give you um, a little tour. And so I'm going to introduce Dave Jordan, and I'm going to remove the presentation so that he can actually share his screen and share a little bit about Brainware with you. Great. Thanks, Betsy. Uh, hopefully, I'm coming in clearly to everybody today. You sound great. Uh, all right, let me just jump back in. So one of the things that uh, we're going to do today, and, and hopefully the objective, is to give people enough of a taste of, of what the program consists of and all the exercises um, and things like that. So what you're looking at right now is one exercise out of 20. Uh, there's 20 exercises in Brainware. Each of the individual exercises consists of a variety of levels of difficulty. Uh, so for level one, this is, uh, excuse me, for bear shuffle, this is level one. And as you can see, there are instructions prior to each exercise that are task specific, um, coinciding with uh, which level you're on. So we'll try to show you a little bit of the, uh, probably about four or five out of the 20. So that's really a fraction uh, of what all is uh, included in Brainware. Uh, so like I said, we'll, we'll try to touch on as much as we can, uh, but for, for time restraints, uh, we may not be able to get into everything. But hopefully we do a good, uh, a well enough job of uh, kind of painting the picture and leaving uh, the rest up to your own intuition. Um, in, in creative processes as well. So before the students get started, they have to read the instructions. Uh, level one, you can click on the speaker and it will read it to you. Do you have trouble remembering where you left your shoes? Uh, so there is an option to have it read out aloud. You could follow along. Uh, but the second portion of the instructions, this is what's going to be task specific. For level one, we have three cards. The cards face up and they face back down. Our task is to put those cards in numerical order from left to right. So it starts off pretty basic for level one. Um, and all we do is just put these cards in order and check our answer. Pretty straightforward, like I said, for level one. Uh, the players have to be proficient at this seven out of ten times to move on. So we just continue with a new sequence. Uh, so I think that is uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, another one of the exercises I'll show you is called web weaving. Uh, this is our take on a geo board. I'm sure many of you have been uh, familiarized with, with some of that, uh, some of those tools. Uh, so what we've done is taken this and uh, virtualized it and kind of uh, put put the video game skin, like I mentioned before. So level one, uh, this is web weaving. We're going to see a pattern on the left side. We have to memorize that pattern and then recreate it on the right side by clicking on the dots. Um, and as I am <laughs> demonstrating, it's pretty hard to remember everything and talk at the same time. I think that was wrong. I think it was that. Nope. Uh, so perfect example. Uh, that definitely does require uh, a lot of concentration, uh, so you just keep going. Uh, level one, again, this is fairly straightforward. But as we move up, again, we're doing this seven out of ten times. Uh, but I'm going to go into the same exercise, but I'm going to bump up a few levels um, to level four. And again, uh, same same concept with the the pattern on the left side, but we've introduced a metronome. So now the player is going to hear a beat, 
and they have to click to the beat five times while simultaneously holding that image in their working memory and their visual memory. And then using your flexible attention and divided attention, focus on a new task, which is clicking to the beat five times, retaining in uh, being cognizant of how many times you're actually clicking to the beat, because if you overclick uh, six times, you have to start over. Same as if you underclick and just do it four times. So you have to be, again, cognizant of how many times you're clicking to the beat. Uh, once you click to the beat five times, you go back and retrieve that initial image, and hopefully you can do that seven out of ten times. So I'm going to turn on my speaker so hopefully you can hear the beat. There's our pattern. And again, I've got two click to the beat. So one, two, three, four, five. And believe it or not, I definitely forgot what the pattern was. Uh, so again. Nope. Uh, but that's just a great example of what happens when you get it wrong. There's a different sound and you have to start over with a new pattern. Uh, so I, I Again, I'm just going to jump out of there. Uh, and as you'd imagine, as this exercise progresses even more, this is level seven, same thing with the beat, uh, but the pattern is much, much, much more complex. And here's a quick example. Um, so I'm not going to attempt that. I think it's a, an, enough for this exercise. Uh, another one that I'll show you is called Iguana Lookout. This is a great exercise for directionality. For level one, we are just labeling the arrows on our on our screen, uh, just matching them up with their coinciding uh, position buttons at the bottom of the screen. So again, level one, really basic. We've got two lines, left, right, up, and down, and just we're matching those up. But as you can see, there's another level of processing that we add on top of uh, the initial task. Those buttons are not arranged in a manner that you'd imagine. Again, that cognitive flexibility when your environment changes and uh, you have to adapt. That's one of the key roles and uh, the effectiveness of what we're doing in all these exercises. So if you have that type of lens on it, um, just kind of keep at it. Uh, so again, down, left, up, right, up. Oops. Sorry, try again. <laughs> again, I'm having a rough day. So that's a, an example of what happens when you get it wrong. Red is wrong. Green will be correct. And you just get a new set of arrows. I just want to underscore one of the things that Dave has talked about, which is while he's focused on um, some of the skills that are emphasized in the exercises, um, the exercises don't develop just single skills or, um, or or have just one a skill developed in one area. Um, obviously, directionality was um, important in web weaving. It's also going to be important in three tic tac toe and some of the other. Um, exercise in the program. So the skills are developed in lots of different ways and different combinations throughout the program. And it's just important to um, make sure everybody understands that that's part of this, the way that this program was built and part of its structure. Right. Um, so another one that, that Betsy mentioned was called tree tic-tac-toe. Uh, so this is uh, level one is really basic and straightforward. Um, so like, like we said, or like one of the things Betsy mentioned earlier was that all these modalities have been adopted from a variety of disciplines. Uh, so having all these exercises and all these principles and concepts, uh, what have you, having them all in one place is great. Uh, what's even more effective and more beneficial is how we access those exercises. Uh, so again, we want to make sure we're moving around and developing a variety of skills. So in the actual exercise uh, tab or uh, chart, you can see a skills button. So that will actually outline all the cognitive skills that you're working on in each of those exercises. So that list is going to be specific to that exercise for that level. And as we progress through an exercise, we layer more cognitive skills on top of that foundation. Uh, so again, that really is what makes the program so effective is how we train, not a matter of if we train. Uh, so level one is really straightforward. We're just we're just blocking. Everybody enjoys tic-tac-toe, uh, so we just get comfortable with doing the task, uh, and all we do is block. So, good job for me, and we just keep going. Uh, but what I'll do is jump out of that level, but staying within the exercise, and this is where things really get 
really get cool with the technology. Uh, there's some things you can't really do with paper and pencil that we've done uh, with, with the video game technology. So if I'm going to visualize a little bit of what, we're, what the task is for level four. We're going to have three grids on the screen. We want to visualize as if each of those three grids were layered on top of one another, functioning as one universal tic-tac-toe board. Uh, on the X, the computer is the O. We take turns, and we also have to alternate from each grid. Uh, all that is, is explained in the directions. So I'm going to play first on the left grid. The computer's first move goes to the grid to the middle. My second move goes to the grid to the far right. Computer's second move goes back all the way to the first grid to the left. Um, so I'll do that a few times. I, I know it may be a little, too, a little difficult to uh, understand just from the description. Uh, so once you see it, it may make more sense. So I'm going to go top left. That means top left is taken in all three grids. They went in the center. So I'm going to go bottom right on the third. They went center and top right. So I want bottom left on the second. Uh, now I want top center on the first and far right. So hopefully that makes sense how, how that, that level worked. Uh, I can again. I can do it uh, one more time if. And just remember, what you're trying to do is to visualize them all merged together or superimposed, as if they were all one grid. Right. So if I click in the middle, uh, it'll tell me that that grid is that position is taken. So I ran out of time, and I'll just do it again. So top left, they want center, and if I go center here, it'll tell me that that position is taken. So, again, you're playing tic-tac-toe on three separate planes, uh, but kind of superimpose them if, as if they were layered on top of one another. Uh, so, again, hopefully I described that well enough so you guys can kind of fill in the gaps for uh, the higher levels of this exercise, what it may consist of, uh, things like that. Sorry. Uh, the last exercise we'll jump into is called sky scanning, and this exercise incorporates both visual and auditory skills. So for level one, we're going to hear three sets of numbers read out aloud. After the third number has been read out, we'll see a variety of number values pop up on our screen. Our objective is to click on those numbers in the order that we heard. So depending on what level we're at, it may be alphabetical order followed by numerical. It may be numerical followed by alphabetical. It may be reverse alphabetical. Uh, so all those little nuances are, are going to be specific to each level, so they're all different. Uh, so for level one, again, turn up my speakers, start challenge. 67, 53, 61. Uh, 67, I know that was the first one, and I really, to be honest, I don't remember what the, the uh, next two were, uh, but I think for the sake of the demonstration the example, I hope that hits home and um, it's either 53 yeah. or 63. I, I yeah. have to forgive me. I don't don't really remember. I didn't write them down. That's one of the only things we consider cheating. Uh, so again, you want to kind of visualize those letters and numbers in your in your mental Rolodex, so to speak. Oh well. Um, so again, we showed you about maybe four or five of the exercises. There is a lot more to the program. Uh, so if there are any individuals who want to take a closer look and a deeper dive and actually get a more exercise specific and things like that, uh, my contact will be shared with everybody and we can schedule a good time to do that that works with your schedule. And if obviously you have vision therapists that want to participate as well, uh, we can all coordinate a good time to, to do that. Uh, so thing we'll leave it to Beth. We're always happy to do is to provide um, a Brainware Safari account for you to use personally and to explore. Um, that's another way now that you've seen a little bit of it to uh, check it out and experience it for yourself. And so if you would like to do that, um, you can either let us know. You can type into the chat window. Yes. Uh, just uh, give me a, um, an account. and Or you can do that um, sometime later, either by calling us or um, by oops, um, emailing us, calling us. Whatever. All right. Okay, so we've got yours. Um, do you want to? Uh, if you stop sharing your screen. Your you screen share. Thank you. 
Okay, here we are back again. Um, make sure to um, ask any questions that you have. Um, we're going to be uh, just have a little bit more to talk about, and I uh, want to make sure that we capture any questions that you might have along the way. Um, so you've seen a little bit about the program. Um, it is intended to be very flexible in terms of its use, although like everything that we do that where we're actually trying to change the brain and establish new habits and new patterns of thinking, um, the key is uh, getting frequency and intensity of practice. So again, three to five times a week for about 12 weeks because that is the kind of usage that is um, has been found in our research to be the most effective. Um, it is used in a variety of different ways, but in, a con in the context of vision therapy, um, it is used in two primary ways, I guess. Uh, one is contemporaneously, that is a, that the patient or the individual is doing it side by side um, at the same time, not simultaneously at the exact same moment, but um, they're doing vision therapy over a number of weeks or months and they're doing uh, brain wear sort of at the same time. Um, for some patients, of course, their visual issues are going to uh, preclude them really from being successful in brain wear and you're going to have to address those first. And so it is often then used as a, as a second stage. Um, we did not show this to you today but are happy to do this um, at another time and can give you some information. And um, there, there is what we call the coach view, which allows you to monitor patient progress. Um, you'll be able to verify that they are, in fact, doing it with the frequency and intensity that you are um, suggesting and that we suggest, um, as well as seeing the areas where they are uh, doing really well, the areas where they are struggling. Um, and um, at that point, then you can bring your other skills to bear and um, make suggestions and recommendations about how they approach the program. Um, so what people often will do is to, um, after vision therapy has um, started to really show its impact, is to have uh, the patient begin to use brain wear, maybe um, using it mostly at home, but possibly um, also using it. We, we all know those individuals who just, you know, won't do it unless you're hovering over them. but. Um, and so you could you can certainly do that. It could be used in the office, but um, often it can be used uh, because it is so flexible at home, um, where you might have them come back uh, once a week, once every couple of weeks for a period of time to review their progress, to make sure that they're doing it properly, and to look at the kinds of changes that they're observing. So the greatest impact, of course, is going to be with good coaching from you and from your um, colleagues, and um, uh, that will make a tremendous difference. This is not, um, it is not a babysitter. It's not something that you just send home with somebody and say, good luck um, for the best possible results. You really, uh, the best um, approach is to monitor their usage and provide that kind of good coaching support as you do with everything else. Um, <coughs> the cost of the software, we will send you that um, in an email. Um, so that you'll see what's involved for clinicians. And, um, oh, Mary, I actually answered your question, it looks like, already. Yes. There is, um, you just log in for, um, in a, any browser um, to what we call the coach view, and you will see all of your patients and be able then to dig into their individual results, uh, see where they're doing well and where they're struggling. Um, yes, and in terms of the way that the um, program works, um, once a uh, level is passed, um, it does take them to the next level, and it doesn't permit them to go backwards. Now, remember, and so you will sometimes have, have individuals using the program who get to a level where they are stuck for a while. They're struggling. What we recommend at that point is that you just move them to a different exercise, or they just move themselves to a different exercise, which will develop those same skills, but in different ways and in different combinations. And that's why the program is structured the way that it is, so that they can move around and they will be able to um, uh, develop those skills, in, as I said, in a different way. And then when they come back to the, the exercise that was really challenging for them, very often they will be able to pass it and it will surprise them. And that's really just the, the brain is now has those stronger skills in bringing them to the party. Uh, so there is uh, 
I, I know that there are some clinicians who would like to be able to manually control the level. Um, that's not a feature of this uh, program at this point. And um, MRG, we are going to be sending the cost of the software um, to all of you in, uh, in the email that we sent, so you'll have all of that information about the different options that you would have to use as a clinician with your, with your patients. So, are there any other, I'm going back to see um, if we've answered the questions. It looks like we've done a pretty good job so far. But we'll give you a moment to, is there anything else, Dave, that you would ask? Is there an age limit? Um, that's a great question. Uh, we don't recommend the program below the age of six, and that is um, based on experience. Um, uh, we have had with a lot of different age groups. The program does, you do need to know your numbers to 100, and you need to know the alphabet. Um, most six-year-olds, although not all of them, uh, can do that, and but you may want to uh, make a judgment based on their individual capabilities. Uh, but uh, we've also had people using it all the way up into their, well, frankly, into their 80s. Um, I don't know anybody older than that at this point, but a variety of different ages. Um, it, it's, it's really fascinating how everybody has cognitive strengths and weaknesses, and we all um, successful adults have managed to compensate for the areas that aren't as strong, but I can tell you what mine are and the kinds of things that uh, Brainware was really, which had to do with my, my visual processing, um, that have been really um, important for me. Uh, but other adults have talked about things like um, uh, being able to really focus and organize their thoughts about their work. Um, we have a, a wonderful intern working with us this summer who's uh, 19, just about to turn 20, and he came back from uh, a week away and said, you know, I, I never was able to remember people's names before when I met them, and now I can. So it's always interesting what people observe in terms of how this translates into their real lives. Um, okay, Lynn is asking, many of my patients have difficulty retaining skills. Um, and you're saying they can go back to the skill level, but only at a higher level. Um, yes and no. So um, the, the, the whole idea, of course, behind Brainware and any kind of cognitive training is you want to practice the skills to the level of automaticity. And so you may do something over and over and over again. Um, in general, one level leads to the next, but there are also other exercises that are going to develop those same skills but in different ways. And so that is what, moving around and experiencing that is what's going to then um, help them do it at that higher skill. You, of course, the, the whole idea is that you want to be in that zone of proximal development. You want to be at the point where it's a little beyond what you can do, but not so hard that you really, you know, really can't do it. And that's what that moving around among different exercises helps to accomplish. So hopefully that was that answered that question. And Betsy, can you hear me? Yeah, no, I can hear you. Yep. Uh, so I just wanted to jump in on that. Um, and again, it's uh, like I was saying earlier, it's all about how you're using the program. Um, and what Betsy was referring to, and some people refer to that as cross training. You know, not doing the same thing over and over again. There's going to be a variety of cognitive skills that you're going to develop in different. Uh, different, I guess different ways or they're presented in different ways uh, in, in each exercise. So the, the exercises have their own type of personality, if you will, uh, that consists of a variety of cognitive skills. Uh, so again, hopefully that made more sense. Or yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Thanks for, for adding that, Dave. Um, just want to make sure before we wrap up, um, uh, we didn't talk about the specific cost of the software. That, um, we have special pricing for clinicians which we will be sending you that information uh, via email. Um, this is a public webinar, so we're not going to include that here. But we, um, anybody who wants to contact us about a particular, uh, we do have special pricing for clinicians, which makes it very affordable for you to use with patients. Uh, is each person doing all the activities? Is there a certain progression? Um, uh, yes. So 
the, the recommended approach is to move around and to keep at a reasonably even level across all of the different exercises. That generally produces the best results. Um, we also, and we will include this in training, we, when we um, bring a clinician on board, we provide training. We also have a 24-7 online training and set of resources that are available. Um, so we are very committed to making you successful. And uh, one of the things that we will talk about there is something we call the 10-minute rule, which is we recommend that an individual work for about 10 minutes in an exercise. Um, if you pass two or three levels quickly, then you would move to another one. Uh, but it's that repetition that's actually, and that, that rehearsal, that doing something over and over again, that is actually driving that skill to automaticity. And so uh, most people are willing to do that for 10 minutes. Um, and then you move to another thing. So it's, uh, and it is also very, you know, we'll talk about ways that you may prescribe, um, that you may prescribe them to approach it. For example, we have worked with one of our clinicians um, to develop a specific uh, protocol for those, uh, his patients who are using it as post-concussion therapy. Um, and we approached it very specifically there to, to start them off very slowly. Um, so we obviously didn't want to exacerbate any of the symptoms of concussion. So we can talk about uh, different ways. Um, often people will um, give direction to their uh, patients to say, you know, I want you to work in this area first, but of course you then, of course, want them to work around. I'm going to let uh, Dave answered the question about athletes because Dave is a hockey player and his passion is uh, the, or at least one of his passions is the, the way that he thinks um, all of this plays into athletics. Um, yeah, so, you know, everybody has cognitive strengths and weaknesses like Betsy mentioned, uh, but a lot of these skills can be, you know, further honed or sharpened. Um, and, and help out in, in, a, in an athletic capacity. Uh, you know, pattern recognition, um, having the ability to kind of visualize, uh, you know, the plays in the field before they happen, um, taking in a, a quick glance of the, either the playing field, the court, the rink, uh, and then while turning your head or turning your back to the play, knowing where all those moving parts are and basically anticipating where people are going to be, time and space. Uh, there's a whole, a whole list of things uh, that you can improve by, you know, cognitive training and transfer that into an athletic, um, you know, an athletic example or athletic capacity. Um, reaction time, um, like I said, pattern, uh, pattern recognition, uh, processing speed, uh, inhibitory control comes into some of those uh, realms as well to, you know, not let uh, the crowd or referee distract you from your goal or your objective. So some of those little things that can be um, you know, examples of noise or distractions uh, can make an athlete uh, a lot more focused on the task. And one of the things that I say is, you know, you can only control what you can control. You can't control those outside uh, stimulus. Uh, you can only control what you can do. And having that type of mentality is, is obviously helpful. And uh, I've, I've gained a perspective in my athletics to, you know, kind of just knowing what I can control. And, and regulating that reaction, to, uh, those reactions to not being able to control <laughs> other aspects of the game. And it's uh, one so thing yeah, to the, know that, you know, it's that it's the the ability also then for the our brains just to um, process those uh, those processes, it's a little bit redundant there, but to execute those processes um, without having to um, really struggle to do them when they just are there when those. The ability to stop yourself from doing something is just so familiar when it just knows how to do that, for example, or the, you're, you know, you don't think about how much you can visualize the, the, um, the playing field or the court or the field or whatever it is. But obviously when you can do that, and I, I always give uh, to young people and I'm talking to them who are sports um, lovers, uh, the example of Michael Jordan, who's great gift was that he knew where everybody was in the court all the time and had that mental image in his mind and could anticipate things. And that's, uh, that's all happening in our amazing brains. 
All right, I want to just want to point out we do have um, all of our contact information for you. Um, feel free to contact um, any of us. You've got our main number and you've got Dave's contact and my contact information. We'd love to talk to you anytime. And as I said, we will be sending you an email that will have the um, a uh, copy of the PowerPoint slides, a copy of the published research, uh, information on pricing, and if there are any other questions that we see that have come up, as well as um, the information so that you, those of you who have um, expressed interest in having your own Brainware Safari account to explore, uh, we will set that up. And um, we also know that sometimes there are questions that occur to you later. They may not occur to you at the same, uh, at this very moment. But um, that's why we're here, and uh, would be happy to help you in any way we can. So I'll give it uh, another minute or two. Uh, we still have a few more minutes before our stopping time. So if you have other questions, please type them in. If uh, you didn't already let us know that you'd like a Brainware Safari account and want to do that, just type in that you would like an account, and uh, we will make sure that we take care of that for you and get the, all the information. Oh, you're all very welcome. It's been our pleasure. Again, I'll just give it another minute or two to make sure that anybody who wants to tell us anything or has a question can uh, has time to type it in. Okay, so I am going to um, um, end the recording now. And I um, want to wish you all a great day. We uh, really appreciate your time and um, spending part of your day with us. We know how busy everybody is and are very grateful that uh, you were able to, to join us. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we look forward to further conversation. Um, I'll leave the um, chat window open um, for a few minutes in case something occurs that you would like to um, uh, follow up with. But um, otherwise, I will go ahead and uh, end the recording. And I hope you all have a, just a wonderful, wonderful day.